What does love look like in the relationship? Well, again, this is a very important question. In fact, probably the most important question when it comes to the relationship itself. Perhaps what we need to do before we discuss what it looks like is, is to emphasise the importance of love existing inside of the relationship. And from God's perspective, no marriage actually exists unless love exists in the relationship. Love felt and received, given and received by both parties in the relationship. So in other words, from God's perspective, you're divorced, even if you're married, <laughs> if you do not love your partner. Mm -hmm. So marriage, from God's perspective, is the love-based relationship between the two of you. right? Okay. And that requires both of you being in a state of giving and receiving love. And it's love from God's perspective, not some kind of codependent addiction bartering system, which God defines as love. That's not love at all. And from God's perspective, any marriage that is a codependent bartering system is also not marriage. They're divorced. Yeah. <laughs> they shouldn't be together from God's perspective. Yeah. From God's perspective, the only relationships that will survive are relationships that perfect themselves in love. And any other relationship partner relationship we're talking about here, marriage or partner relationship, any other partner relationship that is not based on love will eventually, through God's laws, be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And God purposefully designed God's system like that so that any unloving relationships will eventually be destroyed in the future of your life. Mm -hmm. So if we look at it from that perspective, we can see that from God's perspective, the imperative is that you either bring your relationship into harmony with love or from God's perspective, your relationship will be destroyed, does not exist right now, but in the future will be destroyed by God's very own laws. Mm -hmm. The <laughs> illusion of it will be destroyed. Of course, yeah. the illusion of the relationship will be destroyed by God's laws because all of God's laws are going to bring you into harmony with love. And at some point, by being brought into harmony with love, you'll recognise that your relationship is out of harmony with love and you'll need to either change it or disband it. Mm -hmm. You will need to destroy it. So we need to understand this. Like, it's a very important thing to understand. So from God's perspective, a relationship breaking up is not necessarily a bad thing. And from God's perspective, a relationship staying together is not necessarily a good thing mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. It depends upon the underlying motivations of the both parties involved in the relationship. If both parties have love for one another, then there is a binding force. And from God's perspective, that is a marriage. Mm -hmm. And as soon as that love does not exist, from God's perspective, there is no binding force. And from God's perspective, that is a divorce. <laughs> no matter what we do with paperwork on earth, that is the truth about everything from God's perspective. And what do you feel about, say we've been talking in this series a lot about, a lot of us coming to terms with the fact that what we call love with our partner is not really love. Mm -hmm. um, what about the aspiration of both parties to love? Is that a binding force? Well, the aspiration of love is different to actual love being yes. existing. But of course, the aspiration of love is a powerful force in itself. So two parties could recognise that actually their relationship is based around codependent addiction and then develop within themselves, recognising at that point that from God's perspective, they're divorced. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't matter what they think about it. And then at that point, recognize that they need to change that and they want and they both desire to change it. In other words, they both have the aspiration to change it mm -hmm. and to become more loving with each other. And therefore, there is the beginnings of a relationship from God's perspective. Yep. And as they develop their, their, the aspect of love, so rather than being in codependent addiction anymore, they're actually, depend, they're actually de developing this loving relationship from God's definition of it. Then, of course, they're now entering a union from God's perspective that has the basis for a positive union that is of love, right? Yeah. So, so from God's perspective, that would be fine. Yeah. The problem is when people don't enter a union of any kind, including a sexual one, with any desire 
for love to be present. Yeah. From God's perspective, that is immoral and unethical mm -hmm. and therefore wrong. And there will be soul-based consequences, okay. penalties that the laws demand, God's laws of love, in fact, demand upon the person if they engage those kind of relationships. So when you engage relationship after relationship after relationship in codependent addiction and facade, only to have it break up when you realize the truth, you have actually committed many sins from God's perspective with regard to sins about love. And as a result of those particular sins, you will have a degrading soul condition, mm -hmm. something that will need to be addressed either at your passing or, or beyond or beforehand, depending on when you choose to address it. So having a codependent addiction in a rela in relationship that's primarily based around a codependent addiction that I'm married to the person mm -hmm. from God's perspective is a sin, mm. right? And this is a very different viewpoint to yeah. what humankind and people religiously have of marriage. Yeah. If you maintain facade and codependent addiction and do not have truth in the relationship and frequently lie in the relationship and do not have humility in your relationship and you are frequently unloving to each other in the relationship, you have sinned many, many times from God's perspective. Yep. And staying together and sinning is just as bad as being apart and sinning. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So we need to get our perspective right from yes. God's perspective. The paperwork does not matter. No. I, what matters is the heartfelt attitude on the part of each party involved in the relationship. Yeah. And is, are those people focused on developing this relationship in harmony with God's love, truth, and in harmony with their own humility? Mm -hmm. If they are, then there is a binding force, mm -hmm. a marriage, if you could call it that from God's perspective between the two parties yeah. but if that does not exist no marriage exists mm -hmm. from god's perspective it really puts it into perspective doesn't it that love is the basis of any partner relationship mm -hmm. and without it it doesn't exist and if it's maintained through without using it. other things yeah codependence and or domination and or just hoping submission. to be around for the children yes <laughs> a sense of martyrdom or perseverance or long sufferingness or, or whatever that actually that's the perpetration of a sin that has law of compensation effects upon the human soul yeah. both parties in the relationship in yeah. fact yeah yes and and it's very important to understand that if you remain in such relationships without addressing the problem mm -hmm. is that's different than remaining yes. in the relationship while addressing the problem yeah which are two very different states. When in fact God views them completely differently, doesn't he? Yes. One, staying without even wanting to address, just wanting to stay in denial, not wanting to address any of the issues. Is basically a purposeful sin on God's, from, from God's, God's perspective. analysis. Whereas someone who's in the relationship and decides, look, whoa, we've got problems. We just watched uh, series one, uh, session one, two and three of partner relationships. There's some work to do. I want to do that work and I want to take responsibility for my issues. Yes. From God's perspective, now we're entering the zone of actually repairing damage Correct. and moving away from compensatory effects for our And moving issues. away from sin. Yeah. We're moving towards the, the aspect of living in harmony or perfecting our love. Which is cool, isn't it? Which is exactly <laughs> what God would like us to do. And in yeah. fact, it's exactly what all of God's laws were designed to bring us to do. Yeah. All of God's laws are redemptive and educational in nature. And they are all about trying to educate us about how to become a loving partner in a partner-based relationship and, and educate us that love is the binding force of the relationship. Without love, there is no binding force. And every person who passes into the spirit world without love finds that all of the so-called relationships they've had up to that point including any person they were married to is they're no, not even interested in generally mm -hmm. because love wasn't the binding force in those particular relationships and i'm suggesting to people on earth why waste your time with relationships where no love forms the basis of the relationship either make love the basis of the relationship or leave the relationship and have a relationship where you can have love in the relationship. Mm -hmm. 
You need to do something like that yeah. other, rather than just sitting in the relationship for the rest of your life on earth, committing the sin of inaction, yeah. not deciding to live out of harmony with God's laws of love while you're in the relationship. You cannot stay in a relationship that's unloving and remain in harmony with God's laws. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you cannot remain in a relationship out of harmony with love or truth and humility and hope to not sin because you will be sinning. Yeah. You will not be perfecting your love. You will, therefore, you are imperfect. You're missing the mark when it comes to God's love and therefore you are sinning. Mm -hmm. And the, the, there are compensatory effects for staying in relationships that are unloving yeah. as well as beginning relationships that are unloving. Yeah as well as leaving relationships that are loving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we need to make sure that we understand that love is the governing law from God's perspective, not a legal contract. Mm. A legal contract is humanity's desire to try to patch up all of the emotional injuries so that they can force some kind of um, harmony between couples so that society is more co cohesive, so they are easier to govern. <laughs> and God does not do all of those things. <laughs> yeah, throw in a few legalities and a bit of shaming for... Correct. And control a lot of people. Bit of emotional manipulation, yeah. control yeah. a lot of people, yeah. Yeah. get them all to do what you want, which is the primary motivation of most you know, governments or religions with regard to morals and ethics. So rather than being truly moral or truly ethical, they will say, you, you know, a, a woman might be married to an abusive man, but she can't get a divorce. Now, God, from God's perspective, they are already divorced. Yeah. There's no such thing as a marriage in the first place because the man's not being loving to the woman, no matter how much she loves him. There's no marriage from God's perspective under those circumstances. Yeah. The marriage is only capable of developing if he loves her. Mm -hmm. Remember... Love so, has to be on both parties yeah, for so the marriage to exist. I can anticipate a lot of questions about your last statement. Yes. You saying that if I love you, mm -hmm. but you do not love me, mm -hmm. I am not married to you? Correct. Even if we're in a relationship. So what is the status from God's of, perspective? From God's perspective, my soul loves also, you. Also, if you loved yourself, you wouldn't be in that relationship. Uh-huh. That's where my error in love is. Correct. You're breaking one of God's primary principles of love, which is love of self. Yeah. And you would not remain in a relationship with a person where you love them, but they do not love you. So, so I've made that if, mistake in my past. <laughs> yes. And I understand the compensatory effects that come about when you love somebody that they don't love you. Because there's quite a significant number mm, mm. Mm. where so, you feel sad and you feel depressed and you feel lonely. And there's all sorts of feelings that come up as a result of not being loved, right? Some of them addictive, some of them are not come up as a result of not being loved. And that's because you haven't learned to love yourself, which is one of God's primary commandments of love. So in that same scenario, if I love you, you don't love me and don't want a relationship with me. Mm -hmm. And I work on perfecting my issues around self-love. Mm -hmm. I might remove myself from the relationship, but still love you. Correct. Would I be married to you in that case? No. No. Because marriage involves two parties loving each other. Correct. I could be faithful or have fidelity towards you. Correct. Um, but I would not be married to you. Well, in your heart, you are married to me mm -hmm. under those I circumstances. Yeah. But in my heart, I'm not married to you. Yeah. And therefore, no relationship, no marriage, yes. which is a joining of two parties, two parties. Uh, exists mm -hmm. yet. Now, it'll be yet, and this is how most soulmate relationships begin, in yeah. fact, yeah. where one party has certain feelings and emotions for the other, but the other does not reciprocate them. And then over time and development of the qualities of humility, love and truth, the other party begins to feel the same feelings that the first party feels, the first half of the soul feels. Yeah. So, you know, and the reality is from God's perspective, the real marriage is the soulmate relationship, so you mm -hmm. could say that the soulmates are married from the time they were conceived by God. However, they're not married in their own hearts until they both have a conscious recognition of the love that they can give and receive to the mm -hmm. other half. Mm -hmm. So that's 
than a marriage of soulmates, if you like, yeah. from God's perspective. Until that point in time, God still sees them as joined, and in fact, there are those energetic connections between the two of them, but no love yet exists, or little love yet exists yes. between them. And love is the binding force that causes the attraction. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so that was a bit of a preamble for the love <laughs> issue, which, uh, really, which people can see is quite important. It's very, very important. important. And in fact, you could call that entire preamble, what is the definition of marriage from God's perspective? Because really could. that's what you've just discussed at length. Yes. Yeah. Of course, there's a lot more you could say about the <laughs> yes. definition of marriage from God's perspective versus the definition of marriage from the earth perspective. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but they are the basic principles that we've presented. And love is the binding force. So if you're going to have a relationship with a partner, you are married to them as long as both of you are in a love-based relationship with each other from God's perspective of love, not from your own. Mm -hmm. So if you, believe you're in, if you believe you have such a nice relationship, but really from God's perspective, you're in codependent addiction and facade with each other, then from God's perspective, you're not married, even though you think you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's look at what love does look like in a relationship sure. if love exists. Yes. So both of us know that each of us is injured in love, in fact, and until we're perfect, we'll be unable to be completely kind, compassionate and understanding with each other on every matter. Yes. So this is the aspect of love where we're making some allowances for our each other's condition. But not compromise. But not compromise. <laughs> so let's talk about the difference between allowance and compromise. <clears throat> well, a compromise is that I allow you to have the difference in condition, you know, the, the aspect where you're being unkind uncertain, in certain circumstances, but I don't say anything about it and I don't do anything about it and I don't act upon it and I mm -hmm. just allow it to continue. Mm -hmm. That's a compromise. Mm -hmm. A person who allows a condition without compromise states, hey, don't, babe, you've been unloving to me there. Yeah. But they don't run off and find the next person yeah. to love yeah. just because that one compromise existed. And particularly when that person has a desire to address the, the particular aspect of unkindness that, yeah. that, they, that you've raised with them. So, so in other words, they realise that both are works in progress. And as a result, and, if, and they both have a desire, both would need to have a desire to work towards love, mm -hmm. towards truth and towards humility in the relationship under these circumstances. And therefore, when one of them fails in love or is not perfect in love, or you could say sins with regard to love, the other allows, makes allowances for that sin without actually compromising on the sin. Yeah. In other words, they don't allow the sin to get be gotten away with, mm -hmm. but it is addressed and raised in the relationship. So basically you're saying you don't punish the other person. No, because God doesn't punish either. Error. Yep. You don't like hold it over them and use it to guilt them into other issues. You don't man you're not manipulative. Not manipulative. About However, you injury. may withdraw from a relationship under certain circumstances. Sure. So that, that's not a punishment, that's just an aspect of love. Yep. If you find that the person's cheated on you, for example, mm -hmm. and you still love them, they obviously have to work through some issues themselves first to find out why they did such a thing. And if you stay with them, it's highly likely they will do it again unless they address those issues. And you might decide out of love for yourself and love of them to withdraw from the relationship. And when I say, and when I say withdraw from the relationship, you may even live in the same house for a period of time with them. You just don't have the relationship, the sexual relationship with them. And you withdraw from the relationship, waiting for them to address that particular problem. Yeah. And a person is who, who truly loves the other will allow these kind of compromises, even to the point of someone cheating on them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They will. Yeah. So basically, when we love, we are humble and truthful about the issue. So we've already talked in the previous questions that we're going to raise the issue of love when we see it yep. out of an honor for truth. We're going to be humble to our own emotions about what's what's been what's occurred in our partner. Say the partner's had the the missing or whatever, or, or just even just a little thing. D I don't know. What, they yelled at us. Yes, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> we're either end of the spectrum. Yeah. Hey, we'll feel our feelings about about that yes we'll, but we'll be truthful about it we will we won't let them just it won't, we won't just ignore it no we won't so we won't compromise with regard to issue of truth no we won't compromise with regard to issues of humility but we will 
make allowances with regard to the person being a work in progress. So we'll actually be quite compassionate that yes. the person, hey, you're a work in progress, there's this issue. You're working issue. through this issue. I'm not going to let you get away with the issue. But I'm not going to expect you to be perfect before I love you or... And I'm not going to expect you to work through it tomorrow, but you need to be working through it. Diligent, yeah. Right? Now, this is what I mean by an allowance. So it's a compromise of a kind. Mm -hmm. But when I say of a kind, it's really an allowance of the condition of the person allowing for the fact that they desire growth. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the way God treats us, the way God treats us is that every sin that we engage has a penalty. No matter whether, we, uh, whether God loves us or not, it's immaterial. Each sin we engage has a penalty. So inside of the relationship, each sin we engage from God's perspective has a penalty. Right? So you cheat or are immoral upon, uh, on your partner, there is a penalty associated with that sin yep. that, will, that will begin to occur inside of a relationship. One of those penalties is a lack of trust. Uh -huh. right? You're not going to be able to establish trust again without addressing the reason why you took the action that was the sin. The sin being, in this case, the cheating on the partner. Uh -huh. You would need to address why you did it emotionally address why you did it, for God to be satisfied, not necessarily for your partner to be satisfied. But if your partner is near God, then your partner would also only be satisfied if you addressed the emotional injury that created your sin. Mm. Now, you, God allows you to go through that process and still loves you. And so your partner is capable of allowing you to go through that process and still loving you if they were perfected in love. Hmm. So this is where our question is, what does love look like when we both love each other in this relationship? And our very first point is actually, well, if we really love each other, we're going to make allowances for the fact that we perfect. don't love each other. <laughs> Correct. That, <laughs> so, that, we're, that, that we're not wholly perfect yeah. in love. Yeah. Now, eventually when we become at one with God, we will be perfect in love. But before that time, we are not going to be perfect in love. We cannot expect of ourselves or each other. We can expect, however, the desire to grow to that condition. So within this, and we're going to talk about this again in a later State, yeah. question, question, but we're not making excuses for the lack of love. Correct. And I feel this is a very important point. Allowances and excuses are very, very different mm -hmm. things. We're not saying, oh, well, neither of us is perfect, so... So I'll let you get away with that as long as you let me get away with a few other things and I'll, yeah, I can yeah. even let me get away with that. It's you know. Friday. It's been a big week, whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yelled at me, you know, you had a bad day. Yeah. All these kind of things. We don't make allowances for these kind of things. We, we make allowances for the f because the person has a desire to fix the problem. Yeah. If the person does not have a desire to fix the problem, then God does make no allowance. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, we also should make no allowance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, that's clear. Mm. That's clear. All right. So, love in this relationship also entails that we both believe that if we're unloving, untruthful, or not humble with each other or ourselves, this is the greatest mistake we can make in the relationship. Yes. So, instead, instead of saying, like, oh, you forgot to pick up the milk, as a big problem, <laughs> we see any aspect of love, truth, or humility as a big problem and picking up the milk as a minor issue. <laughs> yes, although we may address the issue if, if it... Uh... Well, it may fit into the big problem. Yes. For example, if we're regularly ignored by our partner mm -hmm. and partly it's because we've asked him to pick up the milk and he doesn't take responsibility for his own milk... Mm -hmm. <laughs> then of course we need to raise the issue. So, so problems are measured not by how small or large they appear to be by the human standards, but rather how small or large they are from a love perspective mm -hmm. and from a truth perspective and from a humility perspective. That's how we measure the problem. Yeah. So a problem could be tiny from a human perspective, just that we forgot to pick up the milk. But it could be immense from a love perspective. It could be a symptom of quite a huge issue of a lack of love. Correct. Or lack of uh, honesty. Correct. 
or a, la or a lack of taking personal responsibility, loving oneself, or a lack of loving your partner, mm -hmm. or a lack of caring for what are your greed responsibilities, or, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So they can be immense problems and yet be minor from the human perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to start seeing problems uh, regarding love as, and, and basically analysing their importance based around the concept that anything that is out of harmony with love, truth or humility is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. And anything that is not out of harmony with one of those three things and is just a little mistake or, you know, something that happened or, you know, or some minor issue, then that means hardly anything, if anything, at all in the relationship. Yeah. So now instead of getting all bitter and twisted because somebody didn't do something and we would we would probably just say, did you have time to do it? <laughs> yeah. And they say, oh, no, I didn't, you know, whatever. I'll go and do that now or whatever. A lot of these so-called argumentative th situations, a lot of the real argumentative situations that occur in relationships automatically disappear mm -hmm. under these circumstances. Mm -hmm because both parties are analysing everything based on the principle of love, truth and humility, rather than analysing everything based on the principle of facade, addiction, bartering systems and other, and other general ways that people do it on earth with regard to relationships today. Yeah, yeah. So it, it creates a huge difference in the relationship. Yeah, yeah, it's mm. great. <laughs> okay, when there's love in the relationship, both... I and my partner know we have injured ideas about what love is. And we've, we've discussed this pretty much in the first point, haven't we? So, Well, yeah, but yeah, but go on with the statement because it's important. We've, we've looked at in the first point that, that because we're injured in love, so we're already kind of acknowledging that we're injured in love, that we're not going to love each other perfectly yet. So we make specific allowances yeah. under the first point based on the person's desire to love yeah yeah yes now this point is about saying look what we call love right now we have to acknowledge this probably not, not it's not a true definition because we know we've got issues we're not loving perfectly yes. and there's disharmony in our relationship we're not completely humble all of the time so we're going to have to acknowledge that what we currently call love is not love from a, an absolute truth perspective. Yes, so this point is basically saying that it's loving for us to acknowledge that our own condition of love and our own beliefs about love are seriously flawed. Yeah. And if we acknowledge this, then it means that some of the things that we expect from this relationship are probably, and in fact, the reality is if we expect anything from the relationship, we're all pro probably already out of harmony <laughs> with love. And we'll begin to acknowledge that our expectations, which are based around our addictions and our belief systems and so forth, often are based upon flawed concepts that we've been taught growing up, which ha but have no bearing on the reality of God's viewpoint of love. And if both of us acknowledge this, we will very carefully consider whenever we become demanding or, and, or expecting of the other party in the relationship. Because every time we have a demand or an expectation in the relationship, we are now not being loving. And it demonstrates to us that our viewpoint of love is flawed, seriously flawed. Yeah. And so this aspect of love allows us to see the serious flaws in our own concept of love compared to God's concept of love or compared to pure love in terms of its concept, mm. perfected love. Mm -hmm. And to realise that our own flawed concepts are not perfect and therefore will have to be given up if we wish to ever become loving individuals. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Okay, next point. Mm. When we both love in this relationship, we have a desire to feel our emotional pain rather than dump it on the other. Yes. Now, this is also related, remember, in the, I think it was point one that we raised in this session about humility. We had yeah. a section here about emotion. But this one is more about the loving aspect of feeling your own emotions rather than the humble aspect of feeling your own emotions. Yep. And the loving aspect is, 
if I feel my own emotions fully and I truly recognize what they actually are, I am actually being the most loving I can be to my environment, which includes to my partner. Mm -hmm. If I, however, deny my emotions, shut them down, suppress them, try to manipulate them, try to control them or any other such thing, I am now being unloving to my environment and therefore also to my partner. And also the same applies to my partner if they're doing the same things with me. And what this then demonstrates is that if we're ever going to have a relationship that's loving with our partner, we are going to have to experience emotion. Mm -hmm. And in fact, love itself is an emotion. Yes. So unless we feel the emotion of love, we don't really love. It's just an idea or a concept. It's what's called agape love, a love based on principle. It's not real love. Real love comes from your heart and is based upon heartfelt feelings and desires and passions, mm. not just on a principle, right? So if we examine a relationship, a relationship, the love needs to come from the heart. It's not, it's principled because all of God's love is principled, mm -hmm. but it's a feeling that comes from the heart as well as a principle. And we need to understand that. We need to get that. We need to understand that unless we're feeling emotion, love is not possible to flow. It's not possible that love can flow between my soul and yours unless I'm feeling an emotion and you allow the feeling of my emotion. Yeah. And then you feel an emotion and you allow the feeling of yours. Yeah. And we need to see the importance of emotion in the relationship. This is particularly problematic for many men. Mm -hmm. They begin to judge emotion as a problem in the relationship rather than seeing it as an important aspect of a relationship. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people who've lived very shut down emotionally, as soon as emotion starts to happen in themselves or in their partner in the relationship, they can feel very frightened and feel out of control when in fact they need to get used to this new sort of state of interacting and so that things can actually improve and love can actually grow. Yes. Yeah. So it's such an important aspect, this aspect of emotion. It affects us with truth, it affects us with humility, and it affects us with love. Yeah. You can't be truthful unless you're truthfully expressing your emotions. You can't be humble unless you're truthfully expressing and feeling you're experiencing your own emotions. And you can't be loving unless you do it either. That's right. Because the truth is, as soon as we shut down an emotion, there's an immediate effect upon our environment, as yes. you mentioned earlier, and we will end up taking out our unhealed emotions on our partner. Yes. There's no way around it. And it feels really bad in a relationship. It really does. Yes. If you're open to emotion and your partner is open to emotion and then one of you closes down, it, it, you, you notice it instantly mm -hmm. and you know something is very wrong, yeah. right? It, it has a, it's a great way of measuring the instantly measuring the condition of the relationship moment by moment, feeling the emotions of the other party in the relationship. And my suggestion to people is they need to understand that feeling emotion is an aspect of love and in love itself is an emotion. Mm. And therefore emotion must be expressed and experienced and felt in order for love to bind the two halves of the soul together. Yeah, mm. yeah. It's a beautiful system God made. It is, yeah. Mm. Okay, if we both love, we both have faith that a truly loving relationship is possible. Yes, this is faith in perfection. Mm. So I see this is a big uh, problem with the world today. Very few people have faith that that perfected relationship is impossible and the perfected individual is possible. In other words, they have no faith that it's possible for myself to become perfect, and they have no faith that it's possible for myself and my partner to have a perfect relationship. They believe both things are not possible. But from God's perspective, both things are possible. Mm -hmm. And in fact, God created the possibility of both things by creating laws that bring the parties to that place. And so we need to see and have faith in the fact that both of these things are possible. And if we both are working towards it, we'll get to a point where we enjoy the process of working towards that because of the joys of the relationship 
and and its improvements yeah. and and the perfection will be uh, abound in all aspects of our relationship kindness compassion understanding emotional sympathy emotional uh, feelings going back and forth sexual sympathy sexual intimacy sexual desire sexual passion all of these things will become perfected if we allow and follow God's principles to perfect those particular things in our relationship if that's not happening it's because we are compromising mm -hmm. on issues of humility, love or truth. Yeah. That's why it's not happening. Yeah. And we need to fix that. Yeah. <laughs> but we need to understand that and have faith and trust God that God made a perfect, the potential for a perfect, loving relationship. Yeah. Just as God made the potential for me to be perfect, God also made the potential for us to have a perfect relationship. Mm -hmm. It's a tough one for a lot of people to feel emotionally, isn't it? Yeah, because there's very little trust that that is true. Yeah. And in fact, most people have tolerated huge imperfections uh, in, in themselves and in each other. And as a result, they uh, often do not work in that, you know, they don't have a viewpoint that God created a perfect system. And in fact, there is a general religious belief by most religions that humans are flawed. Yeah and therefore are un unable to be perfected individually and also that because of that relationships are unable to be perfect yeah. and these are both very serious untruths that are perpetrated on the planet all based around general personal experiences of people but, yes. but they are untrue and a lot of sorry oh. a lot of people have that feeling based on the relationship they had with their parent that it that they feel disillusioned about the capacity to be loved perfectly or to 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 receive love from a person because they i think it's not only that though yeah. there's so many there's hundreds of reasons sometimes why a person may have a lack of trust in god and faith in a perfect relationship as well well that's also a lack of trust in god yeah because if you don't believe god created the potential for perfect relationships then obviously you don't trust that god is perfect yeah and uh, and that's a lack of faith and trust in god yeah so ironically many religions say a relationship a perfect relationship is not possible but but they demonstrate by that comment their logically their lack of faith in yeah. god and lack of trust in god's laws mm. so yeah if you really trust god's laws and trust god you will come to believe in a perfect relationship yeah yeah okay let's keep moving because there's <laughs> sure tons more to talk about uh when we love in our relationship both of us in the partnership desire true sexual intimacy yes i see this is a big issue where you know uh, there, there's many sexual arguments i suppose you could say that that occur in relationships mm -hmm. where there's a differing level of what you know they call it a differing level of desires uh, you know and so forth the reality is that all of these arguments are based on what I would classify as the wrong things being measured. In other words, uh, you know, when we analyse things logically, we're often not very logical because we are missing out looking at certain aspects that cause particular problems. And this was particularly the case with sexual intimacy in a relationship. So you basically you're saying science measures in attempting to find causes, they actually end up measuring effects correct. and causing and, and analysing the effects without actually understanding, causes. understanding causes and where the problem is stemming from. Correct. And then they normalise that series of flawed understandings Arguments. based on the effects. And, and then they then say such and such is true. Is true. Yeah. And we also do the same thing in our relationships with sexual intimacy. Yeah. The way God designed sexual intimacy is that once we're in the union state with our soulmate, we will be constantly having sex. <laughs> now that initially is a very difficult concept for most people on earth to understand and particularly understand the bliss of that kind of concept. And, and therefore the, the soul-based relationship, is the soulmate relationship, is actually a sexual relationship. Mm -hmm. So if sex sexual activity is not present in a relationship, then you're certainly not working towards soulmate relationship. In fact, if anything, you're opposing the formation of a soulmate relationship. So we need to understand that God, from God's perspective of love, sexual intimacy is an essential part 
And in fact, God created it to be a binding part of the relationship mm -hmm. that occurs between two halves of the soul. As a result of that, any, any uh, imbalance in sexual intimacy, shall we call it, where one party has a stronger sexual desire than the other, or one party has what I would call an addictive sexual desire, mm -hmm. or one party is driven by addiction in their sexual desire, all of these things need to be repaired if the relationship is ever going to become in harmony with love. Yeah. This also means that if somebody does not have any sexual desire at all in a relationship, that they are well out of harmony with God's viewpoint of the soulmate or, the sex or, or a love-based relationship. And they a would need to based relationship. yeah they would need to understand that apart in the partner based relationship, and they would need to come to understand that. Mm. So, so there's quite a lot there that needs to be looked at mm. when you look at it. Yeah, uh, what I notice that we've said there is sexual intimacy. We're not talking about sexual contact, but sexual contact. Uh, sorry, I just want to delineate between people thinking right. It means sex you're going has to, have to be sex a part of the relationship. That means we have to have sex and that'll fix it. And that's not really what sexual intimacy no, is No, sexual about. emotion will flow from one half of the soul to the other half of the soul. Once you're not blocked to each other, sexual emotion will flow from one half of the soul through the other half of the soul and, through the, and their desire will flow through your desire yeah. and so forth. And that will be 24 by 7. Yeah. In other words, you know you will be by, bound together sexually and you will not be able to engage any other sexual intimacy with any other person mm -mm. because of this binding force that continues in the soulmate relationship. Not even as a thought or a You won't idea even think or, of it. Yeah. You won't think of it. You won't conceive of it. You won't, even, you won't long for it. You won't imagine it. Nothing. The only things you can conceive, long for, imagine are all to do with the other half of your soul. Yeah. Now, any time that that is not true, it is because of an emotional injury where love is not perfected mm -hmm. and it needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And both parties need to work through the addressing of it. And what I'm suggesting is if you avoid the addressing of it, then you're not loving. Yeah. And you need to perfect yourself in love from God's perspective, which means that you need to stop avoiding it <laughs> and start working through the issues. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and they can be very <coughs> complex, and that's probably a whole other well, yes, series I, of I'm, discussions. I'm sure we're, we're going to have a series of discussions about sexual, sexual intimacy, uh, obviously, about mm -hmm. sexual, human sexuality, and we also will have a whole series of questions that we'll answer about sexual intimacy in relationships mm -hmm. in the future as well. But at this stage, it's important to understand that if we truly love each other, we will desire to work through these particular issues yeah. to get to the point where the sexual feelings flow constantly, 24 by 7, through each of us, and we'll be conscious of it. It doesn't mean that we might we will be having sexual intercourse all the time, but from an emotional perspective, sexual intercourse will be occurring all the time. Yeah, and fairly regularly, that will likely result in physical. Very regularly. Because that's a desire based, uh, the, the feelings are already flowing. Yes, yeah. the feelings are constantly there and there is no um, imposition resistance. to them or resistance to them flowing. So why would you avoid it if you had the opportunity? So, so what happens then on a physical level is wherever the opportunity presents itself, you probably <laughs> take it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And uh, if the opportunity doesn't present itself, you probably won't take it. But you will still be conscious of the flow of sexual emotion mm -hmm. through both of you, yeah. even though you might not be physically engaged sexually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, following from that, <clears throat> Both of us in this love relationship will desire emotional intimacy. Yes, and what I say to sexual intimacy applies really in a larger scale to all emotion. Yeah. So in other words, I would allow an emotion flow through me, which you can then feel and you would allow yourself to feel it. And you will have your emotional response to that feeling or have emotions flow through you, which you will allow yourself to feel. And as a result, if I allow my emotions, I will feel them. And this particular cycle will occur constantly. And so what that means in the end is you will have an emotion and I will feel it. Yeah. And I will have an emotion and you will feel it. And we would hardly even have to communicate to each other in the end mm -hmm. what we feel. So what happens that the longer this goes on, the less you talk 
because you, you, the, the communication occurs emotionally now rather than through your words. Yeah. And you have a complete understanding of the other person's feelings because you actually feel them. Now, this is true emotional intimacy. Mm -hmm. This is what the soul is capable of doing. And it's what many people on earth avoid yeah. for lots of different emotional reasons. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But it is, the, it is a part of being perfected in your relationship with regard to love. Mm -hmm. So that in itself is a huge area. I know. <laughs> <laughs> a huge area. We could spend weeks and months, maybe, and even possibly years talking about that particular area. Yes. But, but I think at this stage it's important to raise it as a concept yeah. so that the people who are working in, into harmony in their relationship begin to start to understand the concepts of, of humility, truth and love as they pertain to their relationships. And even just to begin to <coughs> conceptualise what we're talking about, even yeah. if it's intellectually, because yeah. eventually it will, if, if uh, a couple is going to grow in love together and eventually join, this, this thing will occur. Yeah, um, it's wonderful. <laughs> it is wonderful. It's like if you can imagine that every emotion that's passing through the other person, you're feeling. So you don't have to ask them, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? You already know what they're thinking and what they're feeling. You're both acting. So you act more and talk less, less. a lot of times, although you talk about what you're acting upon generally. Yeah, so and, and you're both in a lot more harmony because you can feel each other properly. Yeah. You can feel it, what each other feels. You can feel what each other's thinking. Uh, you establish now a tele telepathic relationship. Yeah. In other words, your thoughts coincide. Your thoughts trigger some thoughts in me. Your emotions trigger some thoughts in me and vice versa. This happens all the time in our relationship now. And, and as we grow stronger and stronger, it occurs more and more. Mm -hmm. And this is what needs to occur in all relationships if they're ever going to be truly happy. Yeah. And, the, and the contentment of that place is quite remarkable, actually. So it's not something to be feared, is no. what most people do. Most people fear it, and that's why yes. it doesn't occur all the time. Correct. But you mentioned about the talking, and it's interesting that a lot of couples don't talk very much at all. No, and hardly <laughs> at all. I, I would say the average couple probably talks a half an hour a day at the most. Of, of quality conversation about real issues, mm. truthful issues, emotional not issues. Not about taking the kids to school no. and going off to work and all yeah. those things. I'm talking about real issues about growing in love between each other. Yeah. And the average couple probably only does five minutes of that a day. <laughs> yeah, if that. If that. If that. Uh, but, you know, we were talking about how you, when you start to grow this desire for love and humility and truth, often you begin to talk a lot more. Yes. Because you... you well, you're developing you're yet, this. Exactly. You're yeah. in the development phase. Of course. So there's this peaking of talking that has to happen. But it's all about emotional connection. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, like... If we don't speak about personal matters like at least six hours a day, it's very unusual, a yeah. uh, very unusual day. We have to spend a lot of time talking to other people <laughs> in that day. <laughs> or now we're starting to create more together and so we are... But even in, then we spend all the time talking, talking yes. and, and relating with each other emotionally. And so, yeah, it's like if you're only spending sort of 10 or 15 minutes having a talk about emotional issues with each other, you're going to take many, many hundreds of years probably to work through relationship issues. My suggestion is that you spend a lot more time at it than you currently do. And if a person listened to our Jesus and Mary's dealing sessions that we had a few weeks ago, they'd realise that we prioritise our relationships, firstly relationship with God, secondly relationship with ourselves and each other. And that's where we spend all of our time. Most of our time goes there. And then what we've got left over <laughs> goes in other places, yeah. of course. But but that's the primary thing that needs to be developed. Yeah, I was just going to say that you were talking about when this emotional intimacy occurs, there's hardly any talking that's necessary, but it is necessary to move through this period where you're fostering that sense. Yeah, I'm not saying, I think uh, it's think, important the listener doesn't interpret yes. what I said wrongly because, yeah. because misinterpretation of what I've said it can lead to a lot of problems. <laughs> what I'm saying is you, the emotional intimacy that's going between the two of you is the talking. Mm -hmm. In other words, you will be talking, but emotionally 24 by 7, yeah. instead of talking blah, 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 <laughs> words out of your physical body 24 by 7, you'll be talking emotionally 24 by 7. 
And when I say 20, I mean including when you're asleep. You will be bound together, even when you're asleep. You go into the sleep state, you'll be up in the spirit world somewhere, bound together the same, exactly the same way, feeling exactly the same things. And so we need to understand that the concept that the average person on earth has of talking or communicating in a relationship will change. Mm. The real communication that occurs in the relationship is this emotional communication that begins to occur and the telepathic communication that begins to occur as a result of it, which is established, which becomes so established that eventually it becomes the only way that you need to communicate. And you may have words, but you don't need them because you're already feeling each other perfectly and feeling the emotion is the communication. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying because I felt there was room for <laughs> room misinterpretation. For yeah, yeah, no, it's good. Yeah. Because it, I think the average person would say we're not talking at all and we're, but we feel, you know, but the reality is we're talking, you talk more. When you're in a soul union state, there is no verbal communication anymore, mm -hmm. in fact, and, and there is only this soul-based emotional communication that occurs yeah. between yourself, God, and between yourself and the other half of yourself. Mm. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Mm. Okay, so loving the relationship, we've covered lots. We've we have, and we could have covered a lot more. Well, we've got more. <laughs> yeah. We've got more on this list. Yeah. We've got we, four. We could cover like a long, you know, we could go <laughs> for months on this. If, we yeah. But what we want to do here is introduce people to some basic topics of where they can work on love in their relationship. Yeah. Yeah, so we've talked about things kind of in the positive, and now we're going to talk about things that we're going to remove from the relationship when there's love. Yes, yes. So we remove our own desire for power, control, or competition yes. in the relationship. Yes, we see this occurring very frequently in relationships where it's like the couple mm -hmm. is in a power play with each other constantly. It's about who can have the ascendancy over the other in the situation and sometimes there's a swapping of ascendancy depending on the situation yeah. and it's a very damaging thing to do to each other it's a, it, 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 it can really badly destroy relationships if you continue doing this it's driven by some very deep unhealed unloving emotions that need to be addressed as rapidly as possible if you're going to you know to, to cure it yeah. um, but it needs to be stopped immediately uh, relationships that are based on love are not competitions and they're not power plays and in fact I think the next statement is about a power vacuum is that right or uh, not there yet. a few statements left yeah we, I'll say the power vacuum yeah, statement do it because power vacuums should exist in a loving relationship in other words there is nobody taking power and that is a good sign of a good relationship where nobody takes power. It doesn't mean that nobody takes responsibility, mm -hmm. which is a completely different thing, mm -hmm. but it means nobody takes power over the other. No one's trying to win. No one's trying to feel better. No one's trying to control. Have control. No one's trying no one's... to manipulate. Exactly. These are all signs of a good relationship. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next one. We're going to remove our desire to manipulate using punishment or shame yes i see this occurring a lot too where people do not understand that if you truly love someone you don't attempt to manipulate somebody by shaming them or punishing them for their behavior you know you quite often hear from men i'm in the doghouse for a week because they did something wrong one day, you yeah, know. Yeah. This is not the kind of behaviour that is loving. Their wife putting them in the doghouse, <laughs> <laughs> you go, is not a loving behaviour on her part. And the same applies to his. Of course, he goes off, shoot, you know, avoiding her her for a week fishing or whatever. Yeah. That's not the kind of thing that would normally occur in, in a loving relationship. In fact, because you're best friends, you'd go off if you if you were fishing, and I doubt whether you would be by this stage because <laughs> you wouldn't be, you know, wanting to eat meat or harm fish. Yeah. But but at the end of the day, you, if you were fishing, you would do it together because because mm -hmm. you, your harmonies and your desires and everything would probably be more and more in harmony as you go. The reality is that most couples don't work that way. No. And I see a lot of insidious uh, manipulation and shaming that goes on. Yeah. Um, and in Australian culture, it's very prevalent to make fun of each other yes. in public. Put uh, each other down. Make fun of your idiosyncrasies, which is actually highlight your idiosyncrasies yeah. in public. 
Yeah. And as a way of shaming the other person or controlling them or manipulating them. Trying to punish them for other things that you... That, you, that you didn't punish them for privately yes. or that you couldn't get away with punishing them for yeah. privately and the so forth. Outlet for suppressed anger. Yes. There's a lot of terrible. very horrible things horrible that happen. Yes. Um, all in the guise of having a joke. Yes. And, and it's not funny. No. <laughs> <laughs> And it is a way of uh, shaming, you know, a lot of, uh, in say sexually, a man might shame his partner, oh, you're so frigid, you never want to have sex. There's a lot of um, desire to shame the, the woman into compliance yes. with the sexual encounter. You see it a lot with women, with men too, with regard to having him do something for yes. us. You never do anything for me. Yeah. You know, when he's, he's, he might have gone to work for five days a week, but he's got to come home and the whole weekend he spends fixing up things around the house for her, mm -hmm. you know, and she impl impl implies to him that that, is necessary, otherwise she'll be unhappy with him, yeah. right? These are all methods of manipulation and control, very unloving behaviour, yeah. and you certainly wouldn't engage it if you loved. Yeah. You, you certainly will engage it if you're in a bartering system yes. with addictions. Yes. Yeah. And that, yeah. that's very unloving. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> all right. Um, in this loving re relationship, both of us desire to get to the heart of matters rather than avoid real emotional truth using self-judgment or the judgment of our partner. Yes. When we say the heart of matters, we want to get we want to get to their causes. Yeah. What really causes them from God's perspective? Yeah. So from the perspective of absolute truth, what's causing this problem? Yeah. And both of us have a heartfelt desire to get to the heart of the matter. Yeah. We both want to. Yeah. Instead of, a, you know, one of us going, I just want to avoid that or I want to avoid that. Or, get away from me. You know, I don't want to do that. Like, yeah. And we see that a lot when it comes to tricky issues, you know, and quite often sexuality and other issues are, create, are called tricky issues. And so what happens is the parties, you know, avoid getting to the heart of the matter. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's usually uh, they avoid getting to the heart of matter when it comes to worth-based issues as well. Mm -hmm. So anytime their worth is triggered, you know, they'll blame it on something else. You didn't do this. Or you didn't know. If you were kind, you would have done this. Instead of seeing it as, oh, I just feel a lack of worth here or I feel he's, he's not valuing my worth here. Mm -hmm. And seeing it as worth-based issues um, that we then you know, want to shame or blame or judge the other person for their actions. Yeah, and you, it's quite common to judge their partner for these issues. But there is also this other thing that happens where we let ourselves off the hook for our unloving behaviour through <coughs> self-judgment and say, oh, it's just because I'm a bad person, I'm a terrible woman. I'm a, and it's all a way to actually avoid getting to the heart of the issues, Correct. which usually involves facing a fear. And so... Or, or some kind of emotion that we fear. Yes. And so we resort to some to punishing ourselves. Some people punish themselves. Punish with, or judging or... With or, food, yep. with other habits, through just negative statements to ourselves. Yeah, or even statements to ourselves that help us avoid what the real emotional problem is. We are frequently very slimy and slippery mm -hmm. <laughs> when it comes to finding the real problem of something because we want, the real problem is often attached to some very uh, often sad and very difficult emotions to, to feel and experience. And so what we do is we use techniques that <clears throat> we were taught to use, usually from our childhood, to avoid finding the real problem and dealing with that real emotion. And so we become very manipulative and sneaky. Mm -hmm with the way in which we address issues. And a person who really loves does not do that. No. They, they, they have a heartfelt desire to completely avoid judgment of oneself and judgment of the other, punishment of self and punishment of the other, because love doesn't do such things. Yeah. So, so we, we, we avoid those things completely. Yeah. What we do instead is we do we do focus on finding the real cause, the real heart of the issue, what really happened here yes. from God's perspective, not from yes. our own. And this is where our desire for God's truth really comes into Correct. play a lot, doesn't but it? But it's also our desire to understand God's love and our desire to understand love that drives mm -hmm. this. We, we recognise that judgment and self-judgment and, and punishment and self-punishment are 
unloving behaviours, mm -hmm. addictions that we need to remove from ourselves yeah. if we're truly going to be loving. Yeah. 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 Okay, final thing. Love in the relationship looks like both of us always taking loving action to resolve any issues of arrogance, unloving or untruthful behaviour within the relationship. Mm. So here again, we've raised the issue of arrogance with humility and we've mm. raised the issue of arrogance with truth, but now we're raising the issue of arrogance <laughs> with <laughs> love. love. It's not loving to be arrogant, quite simply. Arrogance is a state which basically says that I am superior to you. I have more worth than you. Therefore, I'm saying that I have more worth than mm -hmm. you. Therefore, I'm saying that I'm worth more. My value is more than you. Mm -hmm. And that is not a state of love. Now, when one <coughs> or both parties, one or the other party in a relationship believe themselves to be superior, then they are not being loving. Mm. And the only results that can come from that are bad. That there is going to be the only way that the other party can be living with them is that they believe themselves to be inferior yeah. and have less worth. So it's not only damaging to the person who has the arrogance, but it's very, very damaging to the person who believes themselves to be less worth, have less worth, or or to be valueless. Yeah. And such relationships usually one person has the power in the relationship and the other person meekly goes along with that power mm -hmm. generally although many times in a facade doing so you know they might get with their friends and think differently mm -hmm. but stay with the person for other reasons mm -hmm. this is a serious problem in a relationship having arrogance and having a sense of superiority is a very serious problem in a relationship and unless you address it it will definitely result in the dissolution of the relationship yeah yeah. Mm. All right. We mentioned so many things about love and what we that have. looks like in a relationship. Yeah. Um, rather than revise them, revise all. them <laughs> all, I think that we've, we've now created a good introduction yes. to the next part of this session where we want to talk, apply some of the things we've just spoken about to specific issues in a relationship and yes. the is specific injuries and how they affect a relationship. Well, it might turn out to be the next part of the next session. The next session. <laughs> it might be session four. Yes, yeah. because uh, my feelings are I, I, I want to probably leave it there for yeah. this session. Yeah. I feel we've given people enough information here. We're going to, what we're going to do in the next session is we'll, we'll sort of um, flesh out that information, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll expand upon it, mm -hmm. looking at particular aspects of it, if you like, in regard to things like facade, arrogance and, and you know... And how our will How our will is involved in the relationship. And perhaps what we'll do in this session actually is raise the issue now of will. I think we need to go to that next question yeah. and we'll have that in this session. Yep. And then, then we'll leave the other discussions to the next session yeah. because I feel once a person understands the basics of humility, the basics of truth and the basics of love, and then engages their will, which we'll yeah. talk about now, um, I think you've got the real, you know, a real solid foundation now you do. To, to develop a, a very, very loving and beautiful relationship with the person you're with. Yes, I feel that though that many couples resist these concepts and so then they they feel like they're lost when it comes to listening to this material yes. and that's because just of some personal resistance within themselves yes. that they need to face so yes. that's our encouragement to you yes to face some of that resistance yeah. so we've covered the issue of humility truth and love now let's cover the issue of will yep. and then we'll leave this session there for now